When life gets hard, we tend to give up. Sometimes you think life is over. You are about to hear some incredible stories. So sit back, relax. This is Through Hell and Back. So, my name is Christy, and I'm going to tell you about my life. I'll just let the emotion go, um, because you can see what these kinds of things do to people. I'm going to start by saying that I did grow up in an abusive household, and I think that is an important part in why I ended up in a lot of places that I ended up and doing a lot of things that I ended up doing. So when I was 14 years old, I basically made the decision to go and live with my father because my parents had been divorced since I was two. Um, Things weren't exactly the greatest there either. And when I turned 14, I met You know, I think the more and more life goes on, you know, there's so many people who are hurting. So many people that just want to take their own lives. And no one will do anything about it. But I am hoping that this message will reach people. So basically, I was getting pregnant in my sleep (laughs) and I was getting blamed for it. I was just called all kinds of names. I was just treated as if I was the lowest scum of the earth, which is why I couldn't, every time I got pregnant, I couldn't tell anybody. They made me feel ashamed and embarrassed and wrong and worthless. Sometimes when I, I'll just let the emotion go um, because you can see what these kinds of things do to people. I'm generally a happy person when I don't think about things like this. Um, Obviously. But I see today, I see, you know, these people that I know and they, they get to celebrate their babies and they get to celebrate their family and their pregnancy it's something I never got and um it's hard for me daily and the worst part of it is is if my children deserve to be celebrated they are amazing adults they're amazing people they have overcome so much and they have been through so much and for people to make me be ashamed for bringing people like that into the world they have a problem um (laughs) i always try not to cry i hate crying it's like the worst thing ever um but that was hard it was hard um but now i'm when we, by the time we do end up moving to Nebraska, I just um, had Ashley. Um, and Ashley is about a year and a half younger than, than Allie. So um, I now have a newborn, <laughs> a two year old, and a three year old. Um, and so we, we do, we move to Nebraska. He starts to um, get off the drugs because he has no choice. There's nobody, there's nobody around to sell him drugs. (laughs) We literally lived in the middle of nowhere in Nebraska. Um, And he had a job, but then he wouldn't go because he was withdrawing. And it would make me so angry. Like, 
he would have a good job and he would be doing so well and he would be a great husband. He would be a great dad. I just uh, hope that she's, you know, up in heaven and not in pain anymore. Um, because for someone to do something like that, they must have been in so much pain. They say that um, when someone commits suicide, it, it takes that pain that they were feeling and spreads it out to all the people who love them. And uh, that's very true because uh, that's a pain that that never goes away. That's a pain that never, it never gets better. Um, I think some days are better than others, but if you sit around and think about it, like it's just heartbreaking, you know, um, for her. I remember there was times going to church and there were just past people and they would just look so happy, but were they really happy? You know, what facade were they really putting on? So you never know who you are going to pass, you know, who's actually struggling. And all of a sudden, he would switch modes and he would be abusive and he would name call. He would call the kids names. He would, you know, he'd be raping me, beating me, um, trying to kill himself all the time. You know, it's it's crazy, like, how much anxiety I get. And it, he's been gone for 18 years and... Um, I still have a hard time with basements um, because that was always the focal point. And I think when we moved to Nebraska, that's when the suicide thing became so much more of a real thing that I dealt with. It was, it became a huge center point of the abuse that I went through. Um, if he didn't like something I said, if he didn't like something I did, he would be trying to hang himself in the basement. I can't even tell you how often it was just, it started to get more and more just like an everyday occurrence. Um, I don't, he would just do things, I think sometimes to, um, I guess, try to intimidate me. Um, he was very strong. He looked smaller than he was, but he was, he was a very strong individual. And he one day was just like, hey, you want to see how strong I am? And I was like, no, because um, I could just see something getting broken. Um, but we lived in a townhouse and he put, it wasn't a townhouse, it was a ranch style home. And he put the, the chair in the kitchen and set it on the floor and just punched the back of the chair. And the chair flew clear across the house and hit the ceiling on the other side of the house. It flew through the kitchen, the dining room and the living room. And the back of the chair was busted. And I was like, nice, you broke a chair. Um, but I think he was trying to intimidate me, like, don't mess with me, don't question me, I'm the boss around here type of thing. Um, and I just kind of, I think I was already in survival mode for so long that I was just like, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and so, of course, after, really, we weren't there that long. We weren't even there a year. I don't even think we were there six months. And his mother comes back and says, hey, come back and live with me. And I didn't want that to happen, but I lost. And so back we went. Went back to Chicago again. Moved in with his mother again. Um, and I need to point out here that his mother was extremely abusive to me as well. And I just told this story last night, um, but one thing that happened, um, and I really don't know really where this fits in the timeline, I would say closer to the end of things, um, but 
he was having one of his fits, um, going all crazy and the police were called. And the next thing, um, I know I was, the police were picking me up off the garage floor and I was laying in fetal position, clutching a pair of scissors. Um, I don't really remember the incident, but I, I, I know that I wouldn't have been going after him with the scissors. Um, he probably was trying to stab me and I managed to get them away from him and was literally just basically clinging to them for my dear life. Um, and so that night <laughs> when the police come, I'm sitting outside in the driveway crying and telling them, please save me, save me, save my kids, save us. Like we're in danger. We're always in danger. And they knew, they already knew this, but because my mother-in-law and my husband were standing outside telling them I was crazy. I was trying to hurt myself to make it look like Brian did it. I mean, they literally made me look like I was this crazy person that was hurting myself just to maliciously put Brian in jail. I wasn't even asking to put him in jail. I just wanted out. I wanted out. Um, we definitely moved a lot because he was always on drugs. He was always losing jobs. Um, by the time um, I was actually pregnant with the last baby and Athena, I actually don't, I shouldn't say Athena was the last because she technically wasn't. Um, but by the time I was pregnant with her, I actually don't even know when or how I got pregnant with Athena. But all I can tell you is I, I promise you, I didn't consent to it. Um, whatever happened when that happened, probably not a good day. Um, I have a lot of repressed memories. There's a lot of things I don't remember. Um, but by the time I was, I was pregnant with her, I was working two jobs. Um, I would work at McDonald's in the morning and then, um, I would come home at about, I think I would come home around two o'clock or so. I would have to change their diapers, feed them, clean the house. I had about two hours maybe to do that. Then I would go work at Applebee's and wait tables at night. And then I would get home, um, two in the morning. And then I would sleep for a couple hours and do it right back over again. I was probably really sleeping about an average of four hours a night. That was it. Working two jobs. I never had a day off. And I still couldn't pay the rent. I couldn't pay the bills because Brian was spending it all on drugs. Um, I had a bunch of money in the bank account at one point from a tax return. Went to go buy groceries and my account was empty. Um, so I couldn't even buy food. Like these are the things that were very real that were happening every single day. Um, so then of course, um, another story that I don't really want to get into now, we ended up, I'm just cutting a little bit of it out and I, I am cutting some of this out because my parents did some things and whatever. And I don't, I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt them anymore. I've forgiven them. I've moved on. They see things differently in a lot of things. That part's a very complicated thing for me and I'm not trying to hurt anybody. Um, there's been enough of that and I just, I don't want to do it anymore. Um, but anyway, so my mom lived in Nebraska. We'll just say that. And so we were going to get evicted out of the apartment we lived in again. And so we packed up the kids and what we could fit in our little car. We had like an Audi, I think at the time and drove it to Nebraska and ended up as a family in a homeless shelter. Um, the homeless shelter wouldn't let us stay together as a family because we weren't married. So I basically got forced into marrying Brian. Um, at this point we were together for seven years. Um, I got, we got married when I was, I was, let's see, we got married and, uh, so I was eight months pregnant with Athena when we got married in a courthouse and the homeless shelter paid for the $25 court fees for us to get married. 
Um, that was also <laughs> not a very good day. Um, and um, those last three years were pretty unbearable. Um, we lived in Norfolk for a little while and then couldn't afford that place, obviously, because he just wouldn't work. He would not work. I would work. Then I, when I was pregnant, I sprained my ankle and um, I was out of work for a little bit. Um, I basically had Athena on the weekend and was back at work on Monday. Um, that was kind of how that went. Um, again, I didn't have any family around. I mean, there was family nearby, but they didn't even seem to care. <laughs> um, so I, um, I ended up moving us out to this little town called Plainview, which was also in Nebraska because we were able to find a big enough place for us where the rent was only $300 a month. Um, and it was a house. It wasn't bad. Um, everyone tells me that place was a dump and I'm like, compared to the places we had been living, it was in great shape and it was cheap. Um, things escalated very bad there. I mean, they were already bad. I mean, he was giving me black eyes before we moved out there when we lived, um, the last place we lived in, in Chicago, I was just sleeping. <laughs> I was asleep and the next thing I know, I got punched in the eye and it hurt and I it shocked me awake. I didn't know what was happening. And so uh, obviously I'm screaming in pain and then he's suffocating me. He had his hands over my mouth and my nose and he's telling me to be quiet. Don't, don't scream, don't scream. They'll call the neighbors, they'll call the neighbors. And I'm like, no, I don't understand what's happening. My eye is messed up and now I can't breathe. And he's telling me to shut up. And I don't really know what's happening or why it's happening. And he just had a bad dream. He had a bad dream. And that was the result of him having a bad dream. <laughs> and I could never figure out why he, did. he doesn't know why he did it. Has no idea why he did it. Um, he just said, while I was having a bad dream. And um, so these were the kinds of, th and, and this was like, <sighs> these are not isolated incidences. These are just some that I'm picking out. Um, I mean, things like this became a daily occurrence. I mean, it was every day. Um, so then when we moved out to this little town of Plainview, of course, he wouldn't work. <laughs> I had to work. I was on you know, Medicaid and things as best as I could be. Um, and I would work as much as I could. And in a small town, jobs aren't easy to find. Um, he would force me to steal sometimes. Um, sometimes in his drug haps, he would try to, there were things I wouldn't do. And I, you know, one thing that I started telling him, he used to try to make me sleep with people for drugs. And I would just walk out. I would rather get beat up then have sex with some random guy for drugs. Like you're asking your wife, you would trade my wedding rings for drugs and then pay them and get, get the wedding rings back. Um, the things he did for drugs, he'd send me down to alone. You know, it, this started as young as 15, 16 years old. He would send me by myself down to some of the worst, most dangerous places in inner city Chicago to get him drugs. And I'd be down there by myself. I've had my car shot at. I had a guy beat my car with a two by four, threatening to bash my head in. And the only reason I was okay then is because people who I bought drugs from regularly saw it happen and came out and got in my car and got this guy away from me. You know, it just, the stories I could tell, they can go on and on and on and on. Um, I just, I, it's so hard, you know, people always want to talk, but I can't tell you the whole story. It's too much. It's so much. There's so many things. And, you know, like one of the, somebody could experience one of these incidences in their life and be crushed for life. <laughs> one time, you know, you get raped and you're crushed for life. And I'm sitting here telling you that it happened to me hundreds of times over and over 
to the point where sometimes I would be crying in absolute pain, you know, afraid for my life that I wasn't going to make it through this time. And then also saying, I wish I could just die. I never wanted to die. And I want to make that clear because I never wanted to die. But I will tell you, when I left him, I was ready. I was ready. Globally, 800,000 people die from suicide every year. That's twice the number from homicide. Suicide is one of the leading cause of death in young people today. 1.4% of global deaths in 2017 were from suicide. So here's what I want you to do. Place your hand over your heart. Can you feel it? This is called purpose. You're alive for a reason, so don't ever give up. To die. I was ready. He was going to, I just knew it was either going to be all of us or him. He would threaten it. You know, I'll stab you to death and make your children watch you bleed to death. You know, he would say stuff to me like, you're just a stupid, fat, ugly bitch and you could never do better than me. Um, he was really racist. And so he said a lot of really messed up things um, that I, I'm just not going to repeat because there's certain words that I just don't even want to say. Um, but he threatened me daily. I'll kill you. You can't ever leave. You can't ever go anywhere. Um, by the time we were living in plain view, I was coming home from work, going into the basement, cutting them down from the rafters, and then I'd go cook dinner. <laughs> I cannot stress enough how much of just a nonchalant daily occurrence his suicides became. He would use suicide notes to control me. He would use the whole suicide aspect as control. Um, there were so many times in my head that I was like, just walk away just walk away and let him die. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. You know, people talk about victims of suicide and how we need to, if someone's talking about suicide, stop and talk to them. But what they don't see is this side, the side of abuse. He wasn't the victim. It was me. It was my children. I endured 10 years of abuse, of hard abuse. And, and the whole time I had spent saving the life of my abuser for 10 years. It's just not easy. It's not easy. Um, he, uh, he was, you know, they talk about serial killers and one of the signs of serial killers is animals abusing animals and um Athena was still tiny tiny little baby and we got a puppy and I kind of tell this story because I think it really shows the amount of evil that was in Brian and um so we had a puppy and I was at work one day and I came home and when I get home He's freaking out, you know, he's, oh my God, you got to help me. You got to help me. Like we got to go bury the puppy. And I'm like, what do you mean bury the puppy? Brian had taken this puppy and held him by the neck and was throwing him down the basement stairs. Um, and the puppy was, he was basically slamming it up against a brick wall over and over and over again. Um, and then he told me, well, when the puppy didn't die, I, I choked it and he described to me in explicit detail how he watched the life slip out of this puppy's eyes and now he was freaking out because he was afraid he was going to get caught. He didn't care about the life he had just taken. It was about not going to jail, not getting caught. Um, and so the puppy was in the trunk of his car and I'm just sitting there thinking, Oh my God, that puppy is the size of my daughter. We're next. <laughs> like, we're going to be next. He's going to take us out next. 
Um, and so I just did what he asked. We drove somewhere, he buried the puppy and we never talked about it again. Um, but that wasn't the only animal he killed. There were others and he would torture them and he would laugh at them. And I mean, these were the things that were just really like, you've got to go, <laughs> like you've got to get out of there. Um, he accused me of cheating all the time, all the time. Um, I never had time. I was always working. I was afraid. Um, and he sent me to the store with a friend of ours as we couldn't drive our cars at the time. And so it was really bad weather. <laughs> if you know anything about Nebraska, it takes three times longer anywhere when it is snowing. And so he sent me with this friend and it took a long time to get back and we didn't have cell phones like we do now. Um, but when I got back, I walked in the door and I've never been punched so hard in my face. He broke my jaw that day. Um, I've had to have extensive work done on my teeth. Um, since then I already had issues with my teeth and that just really made it worse. I still have problems. Um, we're finally getting a lot of that fixed 18 years later and we're finally dealing with these problems. Um, but when they say you see stars when you black out, it's true. You you really do. Um, and the guy who I was with just went home. <laughs> he watched it happen. Watched me hit the floor. Watched me get knocked out. Turned around. Got in his car. And went home. Didn't call the police. Didn't try to say nothing. He just went home. And Brian did it because he was telling me that I slept with that guy and I didn't. But I'll tell you what I did do after that was I said, that's it. As bad as you messed me up this time, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to just go sleep with the guy. Um, because I wanted it over. I wanted it over. I wanted him to, to leave or to kill me or kill him. So I didn't care. I just, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, and so I did, I went and slept with the guy. And of course, Brian was like, did you sleep with him? And I said, yeah, I did. And then he never, after eight years of accusing me of cheating on him, the one time I did, it made him stop ever accusing me of cheating on him. That was it. It's weird. Like I don't even, <laughs> there are some things that I just can't explain about how he was or what he did or why he would do it. I don't understand I really don't understand at all um because I had got my ass beat several times for cheating when I never did he would accuse me of sleeping with people while I was at work like <laughs> and I would just be like I don't even know what you're talking about he got me fired from jobs you know I I just think of the most extreme abuse you can think of and I was going through all of that and it's hard to talk about it sometimes because it seems so surreal. Uh, it's like a different, I'm talking about a different person, you know, and the things I haven't even talked about are the way his mother was. Um, we have very strong suspicions. When I say we, I'm talking about my doctors and um, the psychiatrists and things that I had to see after um, but we have very strong suspicions that his mother was trying to poison me um she was extremely abusive too um she would just tell me that I deserved to be beat on I deserved everything her son did I was worthless I was no good I was just the lowest scum of the earth and she hated me she tried to take my children from me um, she, one night she offered to, to watch the kids and she had done that before. She said, why don't you and Brian go try to work stuff out? Cause she always tried to pretend like she was just the good guy and I'm just awful. So Brian and I left her the night and we called her all night. How are the kids? They're doing good. We called her the next morning. Oh, they're fine. They're just eating breakfast at 10 o'clock. The orphanage downtown Chicago is calling us. We have your children. And we're like, what are you talking about? 
Um, she had called the police department as soon as we left the night before and said that we abandoned our kids. But again, she hadn't seen us in three months, didn't know where we were, and demanded that the police take my kids. And I, I only had the three at the time, so I hadn't had Athena when this happened. Um, and so the police did, they took the kids, they spent the night in the, in the orphanage. And so when social services called, we were just like, what are you talking about? Like we've been calling her all night. We were called, we were on the phone with her while the police were there. As she's telling them, she doesn't know where we are. We were on the phone with her. Um, so they gave us until like six o'clock that night to prove that we had been taking care of our children or we were never going to see them again. Lucky for us, Ashley had an ear infection and Brian had taken her to the ER the night before and had signed her out of the ER. So we had those release papers that we had her in the ER the night before. And so they gave us our kids back. And she would continue to, she called social services on me because my kids were running around barefoot outside in the summertime. You know, they were always at my door. Um, when I said my son, they said he would have mental problems. He does. He has severe ADHD. He was diagnosed with no filter. Uh, he was diagnosed with, um, he doesn't have coping mechanisms. And so when he was younger, sleep was not an option. He just didn't really do it. This kid would sleep three or four hours a night and one morning I woke up and sometime in the middle of the night he <laughs> carried the biggest kitchen knife we had up the stairs and was in the closet chopping up CDs <laughs> the kind of stuff he's he's he did as a kid you know like just curious boy doing dangerously weird things um and so my decision was to put a lock on his bedroom door after that. And I did. Um, I would lock the door when I went to sleep at night um, just because I was afraid he would stab himself or hurt himself worse. Um, and of course, social services shows up at my door. Oh, we hear you're locking your children in their room. And I said, hold on. When in the kitchen, I grabbed a butcher knife. I said, my four-year-old son walked upstairs in the middle of the night with this knife. This is why the door is locked for his safety. And they said, oh, never mind." And they left. And that was the end of that time. Um, I did call social services. Well, my mother-in-law called, this is towards the end. My mother-in-law called social services. And um, finally, I agreed. I said, I'll leave the case open if you help me get out. And so social services set up a place for me to go. They set up how I was going to get out everything. And we had to do it in private secret. The day before I was supposed to go, they came over and told my husband everything. I had to lie through my teeth to avoid getting beat. But that was the last time that I willingly dealt with social services. Never again. I won't ever do it ever again ever. Um, but I guess, um, I'll just tell you, I guess how things ended. Um, because I honestly, I could go on for days. I could go on for probably months, years of details of things that happened and went on. And so, um, Brian one day was having one of his fits of rage and um, at this point, so this is all in a four month period. Um, I said earlier that one of the things Brian used to do was in the morning, he would wake me up by punching me in the kidney. Um, and that caused some kidney damage. Um, they also, that's also another reason why they think I was being poisoned was because some of the, these health problems I was having. Um, but I was also on the Depravera shot and then I got kidney stones, um, but somehow or another, I managed to get pregnant a fifth time. Ultimately, um, in the process of all this stuff, I did lose that baby, um, which I'm not that upset about. And it might sound horrible, but with everything that was going on, with all the health problems I was having, 
the baby wasn't developing, it would have had real problems. Um, they don't, they, they said that it was, the baby didn't even have a heartbeat by the time it was supposed to. So it's, it's again, a much longer story. Um, but, um, so I was very sick. Uh, I was in and out of the hospital. Uh, I was to the point where my dad had come with me. He had taken me to the hospital at one point because I would just, I was crashing pretty hard. And, um, so, and I'm, I'm just going to tell you, even though this was going on, I still took care of the kids. I still had to go to work. Brian was still doing drugs. He was still being abusive. He was still doing all the same things. Um, I can tell you he, he didn't even care that I was in excruciating pain from a kidney stone. He still took what he wanted when he wanted. I would be in tears and screaming in pain and he didn't care, did not care. Um, and so I end up, my dad ends up having to take me to the emergency room. And I remember being in there and the doctor looks at my father and he says, if you don't help her, she's going to die. He said, this isn't a joke. He said, she's, she's going to die. And it was in that moment that my dad changed. My dad finally got it and I watched it happen. He finally understood the disparity of the situation that I was in. So he finally decided to help me. Um, and so, um, we started taking steps to get me out. And one day Brian, um, was going off on one of his tangents and I'm going to kill myself, blah, blah, blah. And in this extreme moment of chaos, it got very calm. And I looked at him and I just said, Brian, I can't save you anymore. And he looked at me and he said, I know. And chaos ensued again. And he took off and I called the police. They went and got him. They took him to the, um, they took him to the, uh, hospital and by the time I got down there, they said it took five doctors and officers to hold him down and sedate him. So by the time I got down there, he was strapped to a table and kind of loopy from whatever medicine they had given him. Um, and so he ended up being admitted into the mental hospital. I'm telling you, every time he went to jail, every time he was in the hospital, like I took that time to get some sleep. Um, because I stayed up every night, you know, either dealing with that, his garbage, or there were times he would try to, he would take bottles of pills and I would stay up all night long to make sure he kept breathing. Um, he would just wake up in the middle of the night and just go off on these tangents out of nowhere. And they were either him crying about how sorry he was, him trying to kill himself. They would be about, he would just start beating on me. I didn't know. You never knew when he would wake me up in the middle of the night or he would start. I just never knew, okay, it's which direction are we going in at this point in time? You know, what's going to happen? Is this going to be, uh, I'm just going to be up all night because I'm listening to this guy go crazy or you just don't know. But, um, so he goes to the mental hospital and, um, that night I did, I said a prayer and I said, God, you tell me what you want me to do. You want me to leave? I'll leave just whatever you want, because I, I no longer cared. I honestly, I am telling you when I said I was ready to die, I was, if it was going to happen, it was going to happen. Either I was going to die or I was going to live through it. But one way or the other, it was going to be over because I couldn't do it anymore. Um, and so I had a dream that night. Um, basically God said, get out, go, it'll be fine. And so when he was in the mental hospital, I did, I left. Um, I told him it was because I couldn't deal with his mother anymore. That was my main excuse. Um, but I moved the kids and myself into my dad's house. Um, but obviously I still had to see him in things because you can't just cut that out. You can't cut it out. You may want to, 
but if you, it is a very dangerous line. You can't just walk away. They will follow you. They will threaten you. The week that he, well, right after he got out of the, the mental hospital, when I tell you that he called me 100 to 200 times a day, that is not an exaggeration. And then my dad was like, well, just leave the phone off the hook. And I'm like, well, I have a kid in school. I can't just leave the phone off the hook, you know, and we didn't have caller ID. We didn't have any of that. I didn't know who it was. Um, a lot of times I would just let it ring, you know, um, because, but it would ring nonstop. Uh, I babysat for a friend and he left like 90 something messages on her phone, on her answer machine. I was sleeping, never even heard the phone ring. And he had left 90 something messages on the answering machine. Where the fuck are you? You stupid bitch. I knew you. one right after the other. And, um, so I'm now like living with my dad and, um, I still have to see him from time to time. I took him to a, um, a bar one night and I said, Look, go sleep with a girl, like go find a girl, have sex with her and don't come home until you do. Like, and I, I said, I, I, cause I was like, you have to get over me. I can't do this. I don't want to do this. Like, I was like, maybe if you sleep with someone else, you'll just not care about me anymore. Like, just do it. Just go sleep with another girl. And the funny thing about Brian is, is that as crazy as he was, he never cheated on me in all those years. Not once. Um, that was his obsession. He was not in love with me. He was completely obsessed. Um, so I dropped him off there. While he was there, this fight broke out. Um, again, long story short, he ended up in jail. He was never charged with anything. He didn't have anything to do with the fight that happened. Um, but while he was behind bars, the police, a cop went in there and beat him up pretty bad. Um, he ended up having to go to the emergency room. He had a crushed larynx. He had bruises. Um, normally, I wouldn't believe a story, but I knew he was this time he was actually telling the truth. So then he um, started a lawsuit against the police department, um, basically suing him for everything that happened. And um, it was not too long after, and I still wasn't living there. Um, and uh, it wasn't too long after he served the papers that Brian was found hanging in his mother's garage. Um, then there was a lot of weird things that happened. Um, there were a lot of weird things that were said. Um, his murder, his, his death was investigated as a murder, um, not a suicide. Uh, they had suspicions that he was killed by the police department that he was suing. I don't necessarily believe that. And I don't know if I want to believe it. I don't know. I don't know if I don't believe it because I don't want to believe it. When you spend 10 years saving somebody's life, somebody else took his life. I would have a problem with that. Honestly, I really, really would. Um, so there's just, I, I don't even know how to tell the whole story because there's so many odd things that happened. One of the things that I was told was they don't even understand how he got where he was. Um, they don't know how he put himself in that position. It didn't make a lot of sense. Um, I still believe that he took his life because that's what makes the most sense to me. Um, and uh, of course, his mother tried to blame me for everything. The police never talked to me. I was never questioned nothing. Um, I was sent a message that said, you need to leave and not tell anybody where you were going. And so now again, I'm dealing with social services. Um, and so I packed up a U-Haul within, within a couple of weeks. I, and I, I'm telling you at this point, I was 
so afraid of his mother. I was afraid his mother was going to come kill me. Um, and yes, she was that nuts. I mean, she literally was. Um, and she was part of the reason I went into hiding. Um, not only that, but because the investigation against the police department, uh, they were afraid that if they did kill him, that the kids and I would be next. Um, and so um, I packed up and in less than three weeks, we put everything we owned in a U-Haul and we left state and we went into hiding for close to 12 years. Um, obviously after a few years, things weren't as, I guess, scary, you know, but the schools were always on alert. They were always warned of the mother-in-law. Um, she had been looking for me. Um, she did eventually, she passed away. <laughs> This is going to sound really morbid, but one of my favorite parts of my life story um, is that one time my mother-in-law told me, she just, she just called me a bitch. And I said, you know, Sandy, I said, you're going to die alone and nobody's going to care. And I'm going to tell you when she died, she was dead in her condo for three days. Nobody knew, nobody noticed nothing. Um, and they still don't have a cause of death. But her death is what finally released me from all of it. Like all, you know, for me, getting that phone call was one of the best days of my life. Um, I was able to do what I wanted to do again and whatever. Um, I spent those 12 years um, living in South Carolina, raising the kids. I couldn't work. Um, however, um, when they went back to when they started, when once they were all in school, I went to school. Um, and so I ended up getting my degree in film production and sound design. I have a bachelor's degree um, from USC, and I also have an associate's degree from Midlands Tech. Um, and since then, you say, Helen back, I'm like a different person. It's been 18 years, and I do still have the nightmares. I have nightmares that he comes back. I have nightmares that he's hanging himself in a bathroom stall and I can't get in. Um, but let me tell you, aside from the hardship of being a single mom and not really having any help, and I didn't really have much of anything, the government doesn't help. When your husband dies as a war hero, there's a lot of things out there to help you. But when your husband dies as an abusive, drug addict, suicide person, people tend to look at you like, oh, it's your problem. Um, and I, I hate to say that, but sadly, it's true. It's true. People turn their back on you. They don't care. They don't help. Um, right after he died, um, it was actually in those four months, I lost the baby um, a couple weeks before he died. And it was a week after he died that I actually ended up having surgery to remove the kidney stone. Um, and slowly I started getting healthier, but obviously I was mentally <laughs> gone for a little while. Um, my children kept me going. Um, cause I would, I started questioning why do I do laundry? Why do I cook dinner? Why do I eat? Why do I go to the bathroom? Why do we do it? What is the point? We're all just going to die. Um, but I can't let my children suffer and I couldn't let them starve. So I got up every day so they didn't suffer. I got up every day because I couldn't put them through that. They saved my life. Um, I was obviously on anxiety meds and stuff and I had a doctor talk me into learning to cope without them. Um, so honestly, I the, the anxiety meds and things I wasn't on very long, not even a year. It was like maybe four or five months. And then I decided, no, I just have to deal with this. Um, and that's what I've been doing ever since. Um, and it's funny because... <laughs> People ask me how I'm always so happy and how I laugh and how, but you know what, when you go through things like that, that are so extreme and so difficult, you really learn to appreciate life. I sometimes look at people who complain about things like, you know, my house isn't big enough. <laughs> who cares? <laughs>
it's not a big deal. At least you have one. You know, people complain about the most mundane things and it's not worth it. My kids are amazing people. My son, even with his disabilities that he overcomes every day, um, they are now, um, <laughs> Athena's about to turn 21. Um, so come June, they'll be 21, 22, 23, and 24. Uh, my 23-year-old daughter is happily married. She's been married for three years to a Marine. They are an amazing couple. Who would have thought that someone who can't, <laughs> I, they've never watched me have a relationship and know nothing about marriage from me. She has the most beautiful marriage I have ever seen. Uh, I'm so proud of them. Um, but they all take care of themselves. They support themselves. They work together. They love each other. Even when they hate each other, they love each other. They are outstanding humans who have not only helped their mother through so much, um, but now they help others. They help so many other people get off drugs. I watch them time and time and time again, be loving and caring and accepting and do the things that need to be done. Um, I've seen them save so many young people from becoming drug addicts, um, from destroying their lives. I just, it blows my mind. And that's why I get upset when I think about how the thought of them having to have an abortion or their lives not being celebrated. They're the kind of people who deserve to be celebrated more than most people I know. It's just amazing. Um, and now it's my turn <laughs> and they agree it's mom's turn to go live her dream. And so I've become this paranormal person who, you know, does all these investigations and I do tours all over the country and I never thought I would find myself here. But this last year and a half, um, I even, you know, COVID is hard and a lot of bad things have happened, but there's also good that can be found because it made me realize what I've always wanted to do and that it's time to do it. Um, so I sold my house and I am moving into a van <laughs> and I'm gonna travel the country and live life and just help others and do the things I love to do along the way. And so, you know, I may have been to hell, but <laughs> I'm happy where I'm at and I'm happy with it all happened, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There always is. It's, I think that's why I don't understand suicide. Um, my son struggled with it for a little bit. And I, I said to him one day, I said, Brian, you know that you can change things right now. You can change things. You can wake up tomorrow and things could be better. You could just wake up happy because depression sucks. But guess what? You could wake up tomorrow and it could just not be there. You know, because unfortunately, that's how depression works sometimes. I said, but you know that right now you can change it and you have the ability to make it better. But we don't know what happens when we die. What if you don't have an opportunity to change it? What if it's too late and you're in a place that's way worse than you're now and now? You know, and so he has over time the suicide issues are starting to go away. He still deals with it some, and a lot of it's learned behavior just from watching his dad, you know, I'm going to kill myself every five minutes. Um, I don't know. I just, uh, I'm just finding peace and I'm finding happiness. And so are they. Um, life is an amazing, wonderful thing. It's an incredible journey. And even though you go through hard stuff and even though I've been through hard stuff, it's okay. I'm fine. I made it. I'm the lucky one. I lived and my kids lived. And not only are we alive, but we're living. We're enjoying it. And, um, <laughs> Those are actually happy tears um, because nothing can compare to that. I, a few years ago, three years ago, I lost a friend to domestic violence. And um, every day I think about how fortunate I am that I was one of the lucky ones. So 
other than that, I don't know what else to say. Other than I hope everybody else finds peace and happiness as well.